Great. So we're recording. And again, thank you so much for being here. It's today, Friday, October 29th, 2021. And this is the first interview for the Bronx uh, phase of American Icons, our oral history project. Uh, and can you please state your name and your affiliation? Yes, my name is Jasmine Ramirez, and I am the SGA president here at Bronx Community College. Great. Can you please uh, explain what the acronym stands for? Oh, the SGA is Student Government Association. So I basically represent the student body here at Bronx Community College. Wonderful. And what year are you in the program at BCC? This is my final semester. So after this, I'm graduating with a business administration with a focus on management degree, and I'll be transferring over to Baruch College. Wonderful. Congratulations on that accomplishment. Thank you. So again, thank you for being here. Uh, and I wanted to start off with just a question on your background, uh, your early life, any influences that were uh, around uh, when you were uh, growing up in your neighborhood or in your home, uh, early education, things uh, related to your early childhood. Um, and we could begin anywhere you like. Just uh, tell me where a little bit about that and we could begin again, wherever you like. Got it. So my, I am first generation Dominican American. So my family came from the Dominican Republic and they immigrated over to the United States for a new life. Um, they had uh, some ups and some downs there, but you know, America in the nineties and the eighties were like the golden ticket. So they were ecstatic to finally be here. Um, my mother did not know that she was with, she was burying me in her um, womb. So um, I was a nice little added cherry to her transition here to America. Um, after that, I lived in New York City. Growing up, I moved down to Florida. Things started to change down there. And then I transferred back up to New York City. And that's where I completed my high school degree and started in Bronx Community College. And I've been in and out for a couple of years. And this is the I came back last year and that was the final time where I'm like, I'm either going to get my degree or I'm just going to tap out and just say that education might not be for me. But luckily I'm in my last semester and I'm looking forward to continuing my academic career. That sounds wonderful. Uh, tell me a little bit about that transition time from, I guess, uh, coming back to New York after being in Florida and growing up and being raised in Florida. And tell me a little bit about that time, the neighborhood, what areas of the city you inhabited, that sort of thing. Um, transitioning back was extremely tough for me because I was 16 and on my senior year of high school. So being down in Florida is a, is a different culture. Um, you need a car to get everywhere and life is very restricted. So I was pretty much sheltered. So being back here in New York City, um, you get this giant wind of freedom. Like you have to do freedom and independence, something that I was not used to at all. Um, the neighborhood, my personal building was very dangerous. Um, it wasn't the best to live on, but that's the only thing that we had at that moment in time. The streets of New York City, living on the Grand Concourse, extremely busy. So it felt, to me, it felt like the early, it felt like, the late 90s. So it was a lot of people. You still have pay phones outside that weren't fully removed. Um, it was very, very busy and crowded. Um, is there anything else you wanted me to add on about the neighborhood? Um, just your reflections on what it was like to live in that building, maybe uh, something about your neighbors or just about the area in, in general. What were your takeaways? What do you remember? Um, since that was my grandmother's house, I have a lot of fond memories being there, but coming back um, as an older child, it became like you start to understand the things. So as a child, like everything is pretty much whimsical. You just play around in the yard and you have your friends and you just see people around. But so you don't really notice how jaded the area actually is. But coming back at 16, that's when I kind of started to pick up like, oh, okay, this isn't really the memories of my building that I had before, but they still carry so many fond memories because of the fact that that's my childhood home almost, or because it's my grandmother's home. So 
I felt safe, but I knew that that was not my end place. Like I needed to get out. And tell me a bit about the transition to high school. You said you finished high school in the Bronx. Can you tell me about which school that was in that area? Yes, my school was Bronx Theater, which is on 99 Terrence Street or 99 Terrence Avenue. And it's by Riverdale, which is, I believe, a, a Jewish community. But it was one giant building and it had about five to seven different schools in it. So transitioning there was pretty difficult for me, especially since that was the first, I was a part of the first graduating class of that school. It was really tiny. We only had about one floor to ourselves and it was a portion of that, but it was just a very tough year for me. And tell me about that year. Tell me about uh, also what compelled you to apply to that particular school, it being a new school. Uh, and what area did you specialize in or in performing arts? Because I guess it was a performing arts school, right? Yes, it was. Um, since that was my senior year, I didn't have to specialize in anything. They kind of just put me under a big umbrella. So I learned about acting and I learned about dance and theater. Um, I came from a private school where you were using uniforms and again, very restricted. I got picked up in the, in the yellow school bus my, almost the majority of my time there, down there. And being in Bronx theater, you get that freedom and you're, I wanted to be creative because I was always interested in that. I was in the magnet art program as a child and I wanted to continue being in the art field when I went into high school. So that's the reason why I decided to go to that specific school. And then it was just, I guess, a lot more creative or a lot more different than I was used to because my artistic style when I was a child was in elementary and in middle school, high school, it kind of blotches out. And then going into theater again, there were a lot more people that were more skilled and more talented than, um, not than myself, but more like they were just a lot more skilled and talented, period. And I didn't think that I qualified to be there, almost. So how did you how did you make a go of it that year and when you graduated? I'm very interested in knowing uh, what compelled you to, um, what, you, what your take is on the role of the arts in, in your life. And so it's very interesting to me that you chose to be in a performing arts school. Um, regardless of whether you feel you were talented or not, I think that's a very brave and courageous thing to do. And uh, I also share a passion for the arts. So I'm very interested to hear what you have to share about that. Oh man, I, I love the arts. I love the theatrics. I love drawing, painting. I love everything about the arts. It's funny that I'm not <laughs> majoring in anything art related, but um, it's, I don't know, like I grew up watching Selena, so like being that creative and like having the, the capacity to be just about anyone you wanted to be at any mm -hmm. given point in time, I found that to be very intriguing because I liked the versatility of it, the flexibility of it. The fact that you're not boxed into doing only one specific thing, you can expand, you can grow, you can be in one field and then kind of trickle over to the next and still be within your element. So that's the reason why I really love the art because it was based off of your capacity, not on just your intelligence if you pass an exam or not. It was, what do you wanna do? And you, there's no wrong answer and there's no wrong way. So I love that. Well, that's so interesting. And so what were your thoughts about art in the Bronx at that time, as you were going to the school and you're going back and forth and uh, going through your senior year, uh, were there any uh, recollections of what you saw portrayed as art in the city? Did you go to other parts of the city to uh, experience art making or art viewing, or did you just sort of center just in the Bronx? Tell me a little bit about that. I, we went to the theater district down in Times Square. That's the first trip that I've ever had, like a field trip. So in the, the, in the high school level. So it was very, very interesting to see that we had to take public transportation instead of a bus to go over there. And then you can see basically your dreams being lived out in front of you. Again, it was mostly a theater 
it's a theater school so we mostly went to just the theaters we didn't get to go out to any museums and stuff but you can look at different buildings and see the creativity and that's kind of the things that we will walk through the city and kind of point out on our way to the theaters so i got to learn a lot from my peers because obviously they've been there for several years and this was just like my first year so i just sit like hung back and listen to them talk and kind of just sucked in whatever information they were giving and just learning from their perspective how did that influence your art making as you were completing your or going through your senior year I performed in a play. Um, it was very, very, it made me, because I was very shy. So I was very, very closed in. I didn't think that I could do something and then do it correctly. So that being the first time, I felt the support of my classmates where they were like, yeah, don't worry about it. We got you. Like if you ever messed up and like, we'll just catch you. So we did a lot of improv because I couldn't really remember all of my lines so they leveled me out and I felt like that was really great because to have such a support system in something that's supposed to be taken serious at least in my head I felt that it, again it it's about the flexibility of being in that industry mm -hmm. so you don't really have to memorize each and every single one of your lines someone will always be there to kind of support you and what was that end product like being in that play? It was hilarious because <laughs> um, I forgot my line. I improvised and the gentleman, like it ended up being like the best part of the actual show. I was only up there for about five to 10 minutes, but everyone was laughing and I was overheating because I was so anxious and scared. But we did such a good job that people afterwards were like, I think even a few years later, they were like, hey, yeah, I remember you. You said this, this, and that. And we all started laughing. I was like, you guys still remember that? <laughs> I was pretty much embarrassed, but it worked. <laughs> so. Right. And it's so, it must have been so rewarding to participate in something like that. Um, were there other opportunities for you to witness theater performance art in the Bronx or in Manhattan during that time? And what was that like at that time? Well, that was one of the only artistic schools available at that time. Mm -hmm. So if I wanted to see any more theatricals thing would be like the Bronx Museum um, is also on the Grand Concourse by 161st Street, a, a few streets off, which is an amazing place. I love being in that space. Um, it looks small on the outside, but when you get in, it's just so large and vast um, besides that one building you will have to look at the architect you'll mm -hmm. see the paintings on the walls you'll see people even though it looks like graffiti in some cases because it is <laughs> it's very interesting <clears throat> it's very interesting graffiti and you could tell the stories like I actually had a friend who did graffiti and he taught me how to read the letters mm -hmm. so you'll see it at one angle and think it says one thing but it actually shows and feels a different way to them. So that was pretty interesting as well. So now I see that they're actually putting more murals on the walls, which is great. And what were some of the topics of the graffiti back then? What were, what were some of the stories that people were sharing through the art form? Most of them will tag their names. Some of them will tag their affiliations that were not always in the positive. And other times they were paid to do this by the building owner because they enjoyed the person's artwork and they just wanted something that was colorful and vibrant. So they had free range to do whatever it is that they wanted to do. And, you know, sometimes it was dark and sometimes it was very, very bright and sometimes it was both. So yeah, that, I don't remember much of, <laughs> of it, but. Nice, nice. Right. And so then, um, would you like to share with me a little bit of what your time was like as you wrapped up at this high school and transitioned to Bronx Community College? If you want to tell me anything about that time period. Sure. Um, during that one time, I didn't really have a direction of where I wanted to go. We visited a couple of colleges and I really liked Juilliard and I really liked, um, I think that was the only school I liked actually out of all of the colleges that we attended. And when I was given the opportunity to apply, I didn't really 
because I lacked responsibility at that time and I didn't have a sense of self, mm. I decided to stay in the shelter environment that I felt that will still be productive in my growth. So when I heard about Bronx Community College, I was like, okay, this might be the place for me. They do have performing arts there. So if I did want to pursue it, I would just continue there or I can just do liberal arts, but at least that flexibility is there and I can still feel as though I'm home. Right. Did you have any support networks uh, during your time in performing arts as you transitioned from this high school, um, even before, as you were enrolling in performing arts and then thinking about the role of arts? Uh, did you have a supportive network at home, like support through your family or? No, um, I didn't have any of that. Um, when it came down to my classes or my um, transitioning from high school into college, I had an advisor who tried to help me, but because I didn't know where I wanted to go and my family kind of, they, they, they make you think a certain way, like the arts isn't where you can flourish. You're basically stuck to being a lawyer, being a cop, or um, that's pretty much it, or being a doctor, you know? So having a theatrical background didn't seem plausible for me at all. I didn't really express that that much to my advisor. So they just kind of left me. They're like, okay, so wherever you want to go, we'll just put you there. Even though my grades and my GPA was very high, I could have gone anywhere. Um, back home, I was living with my sister only. And she was being stressed out as well because my family was kind of hounding her because she was taking care of me and me alone. So eventually, um, I eventually at some point I had no support system. I didn't have my family next to me. I didn't have financial stability. I didn't have emotional support and I didn't have any sort of guidance whatsoever. And that was a year after I came back to New York City. And yet you still somehow managed to get into the school. So, I mean, that's yes, for one semester. <laughs> right, right. Uh, it definitely seems like it left an imprint. Um, and so tell me a little bit about that time when you got to BCC, uh, what you thought of your time there? I thought it was, I had butterflies in my stomach and I wanted to do everything correctly, but um, I didn't realize that there was extra, because I lacked responsibility again, or a sense of self, I didn't realize there were a lot more things that I was supposed to do. So my first semester in BCC didn't actually go so well for me. And so what got you back into that headspace? What were some things that helped you deal with that challenge as you were confronting it? At that moment in time or right now? Over time. If Over that makes time? Sense. Yeah. I tried to educate myself as much as I possibly can. So I started researching articles about how to have a successful academic career. And one mm -hmm. of the things that they stated was to be active on campus. So take your classes, don't overwhelm yourself. and be participate in any activities you possibly can on campus because that's what's going to make you feel and be more uh, make you feel more organized and make you be more organized so that's when I decided to join the SGA and that's wonderful uh, tell me a little bit about that and how you were able to find I mean is community the word, right word? Were you able to find community at the school as a result of this involvement and how did you experience that? Yes. So not only did I join the SGA, but I also joined the ASAP program. When I first started in Bronx Community College, that program did not exist. So I didn't have their support, but now I have the ASAP program and I have the SGA. So being a part of the ASAP program, I did tell my advisor that I wanted to be more active on campus. He suggested that I join the SGA, in which I did. And they, do, they gave me the opportunity to work on social justice which is something that I realized that I'm very passionate about. And they got me connected to, to all of the people here in Bronx Community College. I didn't know that there was a difference between faculties and administrators mm -hmm. or staff. Um, I didn't know that the SGA even existed and that they were fighting for students' rights or that students even had rights. I didn't know that we had, that there was something like um, academic freedom. I didn't know 
anything. Um, I didn't know who to contact or anything like that. So being a part of the SGA, it broadens your eyes and you see that you can actually go a lot more farther than you originally had anticipated. And it doesn't just end at Bronx Community College. You're connected to all of CUNY and the support system that they have will support you regardless. And once I kind of, once that clicked for me, that's when I started to feel more comfortable. And that made me feel like if I needed help, I know someone who can help me. So again, it, it led back to that support system that I always needed. That's wonderful. And I'd like to pivot to what your thoughts were of the campus physically, right? The actual architecture, the Hall of Fame. What was your first encounter with the Hall of Fame like, if you can remember? I actually encountered that a few years ago. So the first time I came on campus, I did not care for the infrastructure or, at all. I didn't care for the buildings. Um, I just cared about going to class and then coming back home and like or going to work. Um, the second time around, I got to see it, but everything was kind of at a distance. But once I started making friends with my peers, then we started to explore the campus by itself. And that's when I realized that I forgot the name of the building, but it used to be the library for NYU with the glass, I think it's the glass ceiling or the mm -hmm. glass floor. Yeah, that's Gould Memorial. Beautiful building. I hate the fact that it doesn't have an elevator, <laughs> but it's a beautiful, beautiful space. And I have friends who've gone through the statues, like riding their bicycle, and they just make it seem like, like so much fun. Like, I'm like, okay, next time I get on campus, I have to go rent out a bike just so that I can travel along because the buildings are actually very beautiful. Even the new buildings, like they're just gorgeous. Mm. And you, your that. friends would bike through the Hall of Fame? Yes. And I, I found it interesting. I was like, why would you, I didn't even know you can do that. They were like, I didn't know you couldn't. I was like, I guess. <laughs> any other thoughts about the structures at all? Uh, the stat that were you did you have any recollection or do you have any feelings about uh the busts there for instance or anything as such the bus yeah. from the inside i never got to ride the bus i still haven't no no the bus the bus the statue <laughs> that's uh along the oh the statue heads no i th no they scared me um i'm scared of statues <laughs> funny enough so I did not I looked at it from a distance and I was like that looks nice <laughs> I'm not going there <laughs> oh my gosh and so then um thinking about this monument right over time um the hall of fame as you know it's a monument that's attempted to recognize service to others as a way of achieving greatness right right uh, could you describe your thoughts on greatness what it means to you and how one can hope to achieve these goals for giving back to one's community? Greatness to me will mean that you've achieved something great, but I don't think that that should be defined in the general concept, meaning that there's like a lot of people, or at least the way that I think, you have to do or be a certain way in order for you to have greatness. And I don't believe that that's the reality of what greatness is. Like what might be minuscule to you will be so impactful to someone else and they might think that you're great. Mm. So when it comes to giving back to the community, a lot of us, we don't feel like we're worthy or we don't feel like we're qualified, but we don't, we don't grasp that our story will be so impactful to someone else that it would be sufficient enough for them to make it to through whatever journey they're going on. So I think each and every person has the has greatness in them. It's just either they might not feel that they're being great or they don't realize that other people think that they're great. I'm not sure if that makes sense. <laughs> Totally does. Who in your, in your opinion, I guess, do you believe is great in your life right now? In my life? Hmm. I haven't thought about that. I haven't thought about myself or my circle, but if I had to say, um, 
it will be my partner. Um, he's very supportive and dedicated to whatever goals that he has for himself. Right now I'm on this journey where I'm trying to complete my degree and he doesn't complain like not one bit, but he, it's a lot for me to do. And he does not, like he does everything else that I can't do. And there's times that I forget how helpful that actually is for me and how that allows me to do the things that I need to do in order for me to get to the places that I need to go to. So like there was, like I, like I was, he was home for about a few months. So he just started working again and I started to feel the weight, like, oh my gosh, this is the things that he used to do. And I kind of, I guess not took that for advance, like advantage, but I forgot how difficult it is to do these things. So I found it, um, like I found it really amazing that he doesn't, he doesn't complain about it. He doesn't access me for help. He just doesn't allow me to be. So I don't know. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. That's really great. Um, and do you think of other folks along the path, your, your life's path, who have been pivotal in some way, who you think, uh, you were like, wow, that person was a really special person in my life. That was pretty great what they did for me and how they supported me. Any other support folks? Um, um, within my family or just in general? In general or within your family, anything at all, really? I don't know. I will have to think about that. Um, no worries. I will say that there are two people, one being my grandmother, because she, she worked extremely hard for her family and having six kids and taking care of like a few others before coming to America. Like she used to wash clothes for people, do like create meals, wash the dishes to the point where her nails were split in half so just to work, make money, make sure that her family uh, received like a plate of food, even if she didn't before coming to America. And even after coming to America, her working like 24 hour shifts as a nurse, just to provide for us and to make sure that we had a roof over our heads was, it's astronomical because I don't believe like, you'll do it because you have no other choice. That's what she will say, like you do it because you have to. But even now it's like, I look back on it, I was like, I can't imagine my nails splitting in half mm. by doing work. Like that's, I don't even know how I would, like it doesn't translate, like it doesn't compute in my brain to how hard you have to work in order to make that happen. And then if I will be, if I was in that same situation, what would I would do? But if thinking about my daughter, you know, I, I, I would do anything for her so I can understand her strength in that. And the next person is, um, I want to say Stephen Powell's. <laughs> um, he's an academic. Um, he's an academic um, person here at Bronx Community College, and he was the person who helped me get back into college during the pandemic. <laughs> That's so great. Yes. Yes. If you know me, you know that I'm very like on top of my things, but I will probably annoy you from here to kingdom come. So the fact that he was so prompt in answering all of my questions and my emails, it made me feel like the work ethic that I have was being reflected back to me by this amazing person who was helping me get back into college and that they had enough stamina that will match me. And it was just like, my advisor does the same thing, which is funny, mm -hmm. but the fact that Mr. Powers was able to get me back onto college was the starting point. That's so great. And it's so grateful. It's so wonderful to have those moments of gratitude, right? Um, thinking about the Hall of Fame, right? And fame is in the name, right? Fame. And it got me thinking about the values that we tag along or link to this word fame. Uh, and 
how is it the same or different from heroism, right? When we think about what makes a person great uh, and how those are different things. What in your, what is a hero to you? Who, who do you think qualifies as a hero or who, who represents what it is to be a hero? To be a hero means to trump over a very difficult obstacle, no? It's almost as if you're flawless, but we're all humans. So we just know that we were courageous enough to get over those hurdles. But I don't really know what defines a hero. Mm -hmm. I would say it's someone who was possibly honorable in getting not only themselves out of a circumstance, but everyone around them out of that poor circumstances. So again, if I had to think of someone in my immediate life, it will be my grandmother, because that's what she did. She got an entire family of over six, like she had her own six children and she had five other children that she was taking care of. And she got us all out of the, the, the Dominican Republic to come and start a brand new life to be able to be efficient because down in DR you have to pay for your education you don't have the money for it you're not getting it mm -hmm. um if you wanted a house you have to build it yourself you know <laughs> so for her to do to struggle for so many years in the hopes that things would turn out great like she she basically busted her ass just <laughs> to get to this point and to bring everyone else up from that so if anything, I will call her a hero. Absolutely. Definitely qualifies to me. She sounds amazing. <laughs> and you She's sound still amazing. around. She's my only grandparent around, too. That's wonderful. I'm wondering whether uh, we can envision the Hall of Fame honoring folks like your grandmother. Uh, what would that look like to you? Uh, how would you do that? Uh, or how would you? think about brainstorming a way to do that. How can we include more of those stories and those folks in a reimagined Hall of Fame or commemoration somehow? Since we have something similar, like we have the Bronx Museum, mm -hmm. wouldn't we be able to just have a wall for them there? Because it's people from the community. Mm -hmm. We can nominate them ourselves and just tag stories of all the great things that they've done for the community, for the people in it, and let other people know, like, hey, if you see this person, this is the person who did this, this, and that they helped me to get, get back into college, or this person helped like, get 20 people <laughs> into a brand new country that's sustainable. Right. Um, I don't think we might have, I don't think we have enough walls for that, but <laughs> it's definitely a good concept. I love that there wouldn't be enough walls. I love that, that's wonderful. And thinking about representation, right? So the few times that you've been to the Hall of Fame, I mean, that one time that you remember, that wasn't the last time you were there, right? Have you been there recently to the Hall of Fame? And um, no, when you think about the Hall of Fame, right? What do you think it's supposed to represent? And how do the folks that are there now, like, again, we were talking about this, your wonderful idea of like, having more folks nominated and commemorated, I think is worthy to follow through on. I'm just wondering, how would, how would we go around, uh, what are your thoughts on the Hall of Fame and what it currently represents and what it could represent? How can it do a better job of representing more people? Including it should represent the people of our community. Mm -hmm. um, this school is built in our community, it should represent the people of that community as well. Because most Hall of Fames, even though I can't really recollect the, the bust in our campus, but there are not many black and brown people on there. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very problematic because when you see these statues of that's supposed to be of greatness and you can't see yourself in them, you kind of subconsciously start to think that you will have to be either the first person to be there or that there is there is none. So you kind of, it's, it's sort of like 
the narrative is made for you mm-hmm. that people of your culture does not race or culture does not have many great people or many heroes and the ones that they keep repeating are martin luther king um harriet tubman there have been so many years ago that happened so many years ago which are still impactful and important but there should be more. I mean, I'm pretty sure there are. <laughs> so why why can't we see them? Absolutely. And I'm thinking even about the term great American, right? Because the whole title of the monument is the Hall of Fame for Great Americans. Uh, what are your thoughts on the power dynamics that go behind the scenes of people selecting who qualifies as a great American to, how can we, start even approaching in a problem solving kind of way, breaking down those repeated patterns that you talk about, the same people get mentioned time and again, there's gotta be more people, right? How can we grasp that? How can we even begin to approach that? When we think about that term, who gets to determine what is a great or who is a great American? I think there's a lot of racial background in that because a lot of the stories that we hear are from people of Caucasian descent. Like even I've had conversations where people, when they think of American, they think of white Americans. They don't think of black Americans, but I'm like, black Americans are Americans as well. Black, it shouldn't be black history. It should just be, like someone said, it shouldn't be black history. It should just be history because black history is history. It's American history, but they kind of separate that. And I feel that it might, there's a need for it to be integrated Mm -hmm. so that that way, when it comes to seeing these busts or these statues, we don't feel at odds when we see a, a George Floyd statue and want to do something negative to it. Because I've never seen anyone look at a white statue un- until recently and want to do something devastating to it, you know, or defame it in any sort of way. But we feel a lot of people feel so strongly whenever they see a black statue. I think when we start normalizing seeing Black statues and seeing Black greatness, things will be a lot more better. As a a nation, we will start to think a lot more progressively. I'm not sure if I answered your question. No, that's wonderful. Thank you for bringing that up, because I think that's really important to bring up and let people know about. You mentioned you have a daughter. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yes, her name is Anuka. She is Mongolian and Dominican. She is turning three this December. Felicidades, that's wonderful. Thank you. What are your hopes for her uh, growing up in your life path, your life journey? What are your hopes for your daughter um, in the Bronx and at BCC or what have you, thinking about everything that you've learned up to this point? What are your hopes for her and future generations? I definitely use Bronx Community College as a stepping stone and it has been the biggest stepping stone in my life like it transcended so many years (laughs) um I want her to not have to endure the things that I had to endure but to understand like a lot of people tend to look down on community colleges but Bronx Community College is such a wonderful place for people to start it might be overwhelming just to go into a four-year college. It's not saying that you're unworthy being in the Bronx, in the community college, but I just wanted to understand like wherever you start, start with a purpose and start with intentions and know that you are worthy. Know that you are loved and that even if it's in a small space that you will find the people who will embrace and support you. You just have to go up and find them because sometimes they might not be able to find you. (laughs) Right, absolutely. And what do you think now, uh, now that you're in the mom role, thinking about the role of the arts, right? Uh, How you plan to bring that into her life Uh, and thinking about public art and the way that it's displayed in the city, in the borough, at BCC, anywhere, Bronx Museum of Art. What do you think people need to keep in mind, individuals, cities, communities? in regards to keeping in mind what needs to be thought of in the future regarding public art, if that makes any sense. Do you- Creating it or deciding what gets to be created, what gets to be, 
who gets to be put on that wall, right? It needs to represent, art represents the time that it was created. And so we're living in a technological world. We're living in a very diverse world because of technology that connects each and every single one of us. In New York City, even more so, we are a melting pot. Our art needs to reflect the people, not just the time, but the community that it is in. It's supposed to help expand the mind and help it grow and think in a different way as opposed to if you take route A, then you'll get answer A. You know what I mean? Like art is up to, well, I'm used to in, up to interpretation art. And I think public art is mostly like that as well. Even though it has an intention, it's basically up to the person who's viewing it to feel the way that they do. And I think that they need to be a lot more active in showing people not just one-sided art and to have it as diverse as they possibly can because sometimes you look at art and you just learn something new from them. It might not be your culture, but you'll definitely learn something interesting. I think they should use that. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I think we're done. Do you have any final words you'd like to share before we wrap up? Um, I don't believe so, but I do, I guess I'm very thankful for everyone's help here during this very emotional and personal journey of mine of going to a place that to me is unknown and just having the support from Bronx Community College staff, the faculty, I honestly feel like if it wasn't for their support this time around, I probably wouldn't have been able to graduate this semester. So yeah, I'm just very thankful for the experience and opportunity. And we're so thankful for you. Thank you so much, Jasmine. Thank, Thank you. you.